Yo, what's up guys? Bill here for Classic Rock and Metal Review. Another edition of Love You Long Time. This is where I re-experience an album I used to have back in the day and haven't heard since. Reacquired recently, gave it this one in particular like three or four listens. Basically trying to evaluate whether I like it as much as I remember I used to. In a lot of cases, I have really strong opinions of how much I used to like these albums, but the details are pretty fuzzy. No exception here. We got HSAS, Supergroup, Hard Rock. I don't know if you'd call them metal, but approaching metal in some of these songs for sure. Sammy Hagar, Neil Sean, Kenny Aronson, Michael Shreve. That's your HSAS band. So we'll go through a little history of how these guys came together. Really interesting recording process that they used here. I don't know if I've ever even heard of this before uh, or since, you know. We'll go through all that. Uh, this is a reaction type episode, guys. Uh, I basically have to... Some of these albums I just happen to reacquire anyway. You know, some of the ones that we've already done. But, you know, I have a list written down of albums that I can't wait to hear again. So there will be our future episodes coming up. TNT, Tokyo Blade. I know it's a lot of metal, but they're the albums that I like. basically haven't had in, like I said, 35 plus years. HSAS, another one. Had it when it was brand new and probably got rid of it by the late 80s. I went through my metal years and then by the late 80s turned into classic rock because I never really was into classic rock in the first place. The time I got into music, it was modern rock right in the metal, as you can imagine. So anyway, ditch this guy by the late 80s. Still have strong memories of it, so we'll go down all that, do a little comparison thing, sort of. Uh, you know, what's fun about doing this episode, and really all my reviews that I do, I go on like a deep dive for information about the band, the album, the era that I'm talking about, whether it's a concert review or a love you long time. And you know, in a lot of cases, I found I've not only find out things that I forgot, I find out a lot of new stuff. I mean, obviously back in the 80s, pre-internet era, you know, really the only things you knew were word of mouth, maybe some metal shop info, and some magazine articles. So that was kind of it. All right, guys, let's get into it. Uh, today, I'm going for my second margarita. Let's keep the fire going. By the way, quick tip. This is like a rubber straw that Target sells. I thought I was buying plastic straws there. I almost threw these in. I think I might have thrown these in the trash. Pulled them out. And you know what? Let me give this damn rubber straw a try. These rubber straws are awesome. Don't ask me why. They're just, they're just they're the bomb for your cocktails. There's your drinking tip of the, of the episode. All right, so HSAS, Through the Fire. This is a 1984 release, March of 84, Geffen Records. And obviously you got Sammy Hagar in here from who had a solo career by this point, originally in Montrose. Neil Sean, originally Santana, best known for. Then, of course, obviously Journey at this point. Just had their biggest album out, you know, right before this with Frontiers. And then we got a couple of guys that, you know, I'm not super familiar with. This was kind of fun finding a little more out about Kenny Aronson, at least. Shreve I knew about. Kenny Aronson, though, he was the bassist for Rick Derringer from 76 to 79. Also played with Bob Dylan's band after that for a while. Appeared with Billy Squire, Billy Idol. Was voted Rolling Stones bassist of the year in 1988. Obviously, we're past HSAS at this point. Uh, joined Joan Jett's band at some point, early 90s, I believe. Uh, but interestingly, both Kenny Aronson and Michael Shreve were on an MTV show called Guitar Greats, and they were both part of the house band there. So Kenny Aronson on bass, Michael Shreve on drums for, like I said, Guitar Greats. Guys, I never even heard of this damn show. So you had Shreve on there, Kenny Aronson, Dave Edmonds was, I think, the house guitarist. Chuck Lavelle was the house keyboard player. I'm just assuming they had just great guitar players come on and jam with these guys. I don't even know. So you guys can school me a little on that. 
I haven't even had time to like search it on YouTube, but I will. So honestly, I knew nothing about Kenny Aronson back when I bought this app. Now, Michael Shreve, I don't know if I knew anything about him either at that point. You know, obviously later on uh, with Santana and all that good stuff. He was on Santana's first seven albums from between 1969 and 1974. Uh, I think he even helped produce one or two of those albums. He went on to become a session drummer and producer after Santana. He was part of a super group called Go that had a couple of albums out, 76 to 77, that also featured uh, Steve, Steve Winwood. So that was something new that I learned. Like I was saying, these deep dives, they're schooling me a bit. And like I said, part of that MTV show, Guitar Greats, which, damn if I know anything about that, but I'm gonna go searching and check that shit out. All right, so what's Sammy Hagar up to at the time when this comes together? In late 82, up until early 83, he releases Three Lock Box and is touring behind it. When that tour's done, he takes three months off, apparently in Africa on vacation. Uh, comes back by the summer. Neil Sean, they re Journey releases Frontiers in early 83. They're touring that album until September of 83. Through interviews with Hagar, it became apparent that this band was coming together in the summer of 83. So even though Sean was still touring with Journey, the songwriting was already happening a few months before the tour for Frontiers was done. So kind of interesting. By fall of 83, the band is planning concerts and they do less than a month of rehearsals before these concerts take place. So it's a really, like I was said in the intro, really unusual route of recording the album where they're basically going to record the concerts and make that the studio album. So like I said, I don't know if I ever heard of this before, you know, and pretty interesting. They're just going to basically remove the crowd noise and call it an album. So Westwood One Mobile is the recorder for the album, or the eight shows that they put on to record to potentially be on the album. Three of them at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco, three more San Jose Civic Auditorium, and two more in San Rafael, California. And that's really it. The dates of these, there's November 9th on some records and November 10th on another. But nevertheless, the 9th or the 10th becomes is the first show. Things wrap up November 21st, 1983. So that's it. You know, these eight shows are what makes up the album. And one of them ended up being aired on MTV. So I'm not really sure of whether that was multiple shows pieced together or just one show. But uh, I meant to check that out on, on YouTube and I forgot to, really. I've been a little busy. The weather's getting good. My ass is outside drinking margaritas, all right? Most, but not all, of the crowd, no crowd noise was removed for the album. Kind of, like I said, just a really interesting way of recording an album, you know? They do some studio touch-ups, some post-production in December of 83. And the album released in March 1984. Lead single for the album, I think the only single actually, cover song of... Procol Harum's Whiter Shade of Pal. Uh, so we'll go down and review of all these songs, obviously. It's what we do here. We drink and we talk, you know. So let's get into Whiter, let's get into Through the Fire. So as usual, how I found out about this album, Metal Shop, as always, they played the lead song, Top of the Rock. They played it at least twice. I remember hearing it twice. Uh, I went out and got this album probably right away. So I don't know. I might have even heard Top of the Rock when I already owned it. But I definitely heard it twice. I think I heard it twice before I bought it. And you know what? It's just a straight up hard rocker. It was heavy enough to be on Metal Shop. You know, the, the wimpiest shit they played on Metal Shop was like ACDC. So it's as heavy as that. This would have been among like the heaviest Journey songs that Journey ever did. Really good song. Really like this one a lot. How can you not? Love the riff right after he says Top of the Rock. You know, it didn't impress me too much first listen. Second listen, I'm like, that riff's great. 
Love it. Bass and guitar going right along with each other. Love that. The second song, and I kind of remembered, vaguely remembered hearing, uh, remembering that there was some sort of, not ballad, but sort of light rocker. I don't know if you'd call it even that here and it's called missing you it's the second song guys really melodic stuff here mid-tempo kind of thing it's not a ballad it's not like you know send her my love or faithfully it's not a hard rocker it's something in between just basically a light rocker or rocker but very melodic very catchy uh you know i feel like back in 84 i was okay with this song now, I really like this song a lot. Missing You is one of my favorites on here. Definitely could have been a Journey song. I would almost think that Journey might have been a little upset that... I'm just assuming that Sean was more of the writer on this one. I would think that they Journey might have been a little upset this was used on this because they, being that they had so much momentum at the time... If, not, that, not that Hagar doesn't do a great job. He does. He, this song's great. But uh, Steve Perry could have did it great too, and this might have been a hit with Journey. You know, it obviously wasn't at all with HSAS, but such a good song, it really is. Now, songs three through five, basically the last three songs on side one, as I remember it. I had the cassette back in the day, and you know what? While we're on that subject, I really these these were the best cassettes, man. When you were a cassette collector. The entire album cover was on the cassette cover, top to bottom. None of that, like, we'll square it off and put a couple songs or a barcode under it bullshit. So this was one of those app cassette covers that, like, was really, you were proud of it. You were glad about it. Even on the side of it, HSAS logo rather than just plain text. Cool. Songs three through five, to me, are really almost like one long song. Although the first one, Animation, not really like the other two, but it just seems to belong there. It's different, uh, really sort of offbeat, somewhat progressive. Guitar heavy with echo. But the echo is right in time with the beat, you know. Shreve's doing this offbeat kind of thing. Tons of echo, like I said. I just really like this song. It's kind of different. It's Kind of a little reminiscent of the late 70s journey, you know? So maybe it's a little throwback in a way as far as Sean goes. That's a good one. Uh, Valley of the Kings is next. That's a great one, man. I really like this song. Kind of rolls in with these electric tom rolls on the drums. Set, set us up for, as you can imagine, with a title like Valley of the Kings, this sort of Egyptian theme kind of thing going on. Not sure why that was so popular in rock and metal at the time, but it was. Uh, overall, a lot of real modern, fresh sounds to the guitar, the drums, everything. But you know what? Not that phony 80s crap that we all despise about the worst of the 80s. This is sort of tasteful, and I really like it. Re reminiscent a little bit. You know, you have these like sweeping guitar chords that are almost like sort of soundscapes for the song. Not your typical rocker, for sure. The lyrics are minimal. Hagar sounds great. There's a lot of echo on his voice, too. It's sort of minimal lyrics. Just lets notes hang a long time. This is like a grandiose kind of thing. But it totally works. You know, if you're thinking this sounds corny, it's not at all. I kind of love it. And a little reminiscent of maybe the best parts of Side 2 of Momentary Lapse of Reason from Floyd, in a way... Uh, but better, you know, honestly. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that album. I've kind of come to like it, but in that way where it's, you know, just a sort of bigger-than-life kind of thing going on. Some really nice guitar work here. Bluesy, echoey. I just really love it, man. Some of the solos on here. The solo after the second verse is fucking knocks your socks off, man. Tremendous. Sean... Knocks it the hell out of the park here. Freaking incredible. Valley of the Kings, definitely a favorite on this app. Now, Giza, they have this down as another song. All right, the fifth song on the album. Let's call it like it is, guys. It's the end of Valley of the Kings. All Hagar does is shout Giza four times, or 
whatever. And that's the end of that, you know? So it's really not anything different. It's just the end of Valley of the Kings. So for rating sake, it's really just an album that is, or, you know, eight songs, not really nine. Next up, like I already mentioned, the only single from the album, Whiter Shade of Pale. Guys, I don't mind that they do this song on here. I mean, I love this song, you know? It doesn't really fit with the rest of the album, but I don't really even care about that. It's just, to me, uh, it's a decent version. It's done on acoustic and guitar rather than organ and stuff. But uh, it's just, the original's just too perfect. You know, what was the point of this? Um, guys, 100 years from now, Procol Hammer will be the only version that's worth listening to. You know, like no one's gonna do that song any better. So why do it? You're not really making it your own. You know, so what's the point? Like I said, uh, it's decent. Don't get me wrong. I don't mind hearing this song. I don't have that Procol Harum album. So when I hear this song on here, it's the only time I'm listening to it as far as my own playing of it. But it's okay. You know, it's nothing wrong with it, but it sort of doesn't fit with the rest of the album for one thing. And it's not as good as the original for the other. So it's fine, but, you know, just passable kind of thing. Next up, Hot and Dirty. Guys, another one that's, you know, it's a it's a decent hard rocker. Uh, you know, pretty, one of the heavier songs on the record for sure. But I don't love it. It's good. It's okay. You know, I don't mind it. It's not a standout to me. Uh, and this album does have some definitive standouts to me. This one's just okay. Uh, you know, just a little basic and not something very special. You know, I'm just going to leave it at that. I don't love Hot and Dirty, but I don't hate it either. But it's just okay. All right, number eight, He Will Understand. This song kind of pisses me off because as far as whether this is a love you long time, this is kind of where I think we're in sort of no man's land. This was the deal breaker for me. Uh, first of all, this song could have been a journey song, for one thing, in my opinion. Real nice acoustic electric or electric acoustic intro and these kind of sort of off time, I don't even, you know, it kind of reminds me actually, it does remind me, it reminds me of Robert Plant's Horizontal Departure, where that's the beginning of that song before it gets to the chorus, it just has these sort of rim shots, it's not real heavy, but it's neither here nor there as far as guitar sound. Uh, some real cool verses in this. There's some cool bridges, music only bridges, you know, but the chorus is just a total clunker to me. You know, I don't, it just seems like a chorus they came up with real quick to finish the song. Uh, I feel like this song is a good chorus away from being really good, you know, but it's not, it's not even good. It's just, I don't even like it at all. The chorus just sounds like something you know, a teenager could write in amongst all this rest of this album that is Hagar and Sean and freaking pretty good for the most part. And you know what other, other interesting thing about this song, it starts studio, at the end of it, it ends live. So I don't know if that was just a little nod to the whole recording process that the band decided to throw in there or whatever, but just a little weird, and you know, it was back in the day, I remember wondering, what the hell's going on? This song didn't start this way, you know? So that's, I kind of feel like he will understand as the deal breaker for me with this album. As far as Love You Long Time goes. Now, it's it's not bad. It just had potential to be amazing, or really good. Uh, Hagar and Sean produced this album, which they did a great job overall. Really can't complain. But this is the one song where I feel like maybe an outside producer who had some song arranging and song writing experience would have picked that up and said, guys, you know, not only is that chorus a little sort of, you know, cheesy, it doesn't even really fit with your verses and your bridge. It goes off in a hard rock direction after you do all these sort of acoustic electric things and so forth. So he will understand freaking bothers me, you know, because that's the song that I think is the deal breaker with this. Because the ninth song and the final song is My Hometown. 
It's the heaviest on here, but that's not why I love it. It's just a great friggin' song. Really love My Hometown. I think it's all live, if I remember right. Great tune, kicks ass. It just goes to show you, man, you don't need fancy verses and bridges and choruses. You just need to get the right three chords in a row and the right melody and vocals and stuff and kick ass. My Hometown kicks ass. And you know what? I kind of forgot that how much I like. I don't know if I ever liked this song as much as I do now back in the day. So guys, first of all, we got to throw Giza out of the equation. It's really just the end of Valley of the Kings. That leaves us with only eight songs. I really like or love five of them. All right. I gave this an eight back in the day. Uh, I've been debating for days, whether this is a love you long time, a yes or a no, or a thumbs up or a thumbs down, whether this is an eight. And basically the question is, does five out of eight songs being really good and three just okays equal an eight? Uh, it's a really tough call. I'm gonna, act, I'm gonna actually wuss out and ask you guys to tell me, is this album an eight out of 10 or not? If I had to, make a decision gun to my head i'd have to be honest and say no uh, the weird thing here about it is that you know sometimes the songs that you love make up for those weak ones in this case i'm not really sure but i have to tell you i really i think i love some of these songs more than i liked them back then i just don't know if that equates to an eight out of ten I think I tolerated a few of these songs back in the day and loved some so much, but I feel like it's almost like different songs that I like now, you know? I probably loved Hot and Dirty back in 84, where now I love Missing You, you know? So I'm gonna kind of cheese out and give you, ask you guys to tell me whether this is an eight out of 10, love you long time, but I will make a call just in the interest of the episode. If I had to say yes or no, I'm gonna to have to go thumbs down with this overall. However, I am really glad to have this album around again for those five or six songs, if you count Giza as one, that I really, really love. Three sort of let me downs in between side one and the final song of the app. Guys, there you go, love you long time. HSAS, Through the Fire. I recommend you buy it. Burn it into iTunes, skip a few songs, make, your song, make yourself a six or seven song version of this and you'll love it. Uh, fun one to revisit, man. These, revisiting these albums, it's like a head trip, honestly. Good stuff. Guys, I'll catch you later. Super Deluxe and Box Set Edition's coming up next, hopefully soon.